I'm very happy to introduce now Nusha Gaeli, co-founder and uh, president of Biobot. And she's going to be talking about how we can leverage wastewater analytics to, for community health. Nusha. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very excited to be here today. So today, I'm going to talk to you about sewage. Uh, good thing that it's after lunch and uh, not very glamorous, um, but please bear with me. So before we get started, I'm ready to bet that almost everybody in this room has heard of a human health crisis affecting their community. Whether we're talking about infectious disease, like measles, or polio spreading through a city, drug consumption or overdose, such as the opioid crisis in the US right now, poisoning in our drinking water, such as what happened in Flint in Michigan not too long ago, or finally, more silent illnesses like obesity or diabetes. Now, what all of these headlines have in common is that we only really hear about them when crisis turns to catastrophe, when there's really nothing left to do but move into damage control. But it doesn't have to be this way. We imagine a city where every single person can contribute to a database about our health. At Biobot Analytics, we're building this database. And this is based on a concept called wastewater epidemiology. And it's actually quite simple. Everybody pees every single day. And we know that urine contains a rich source of information on our health and our well-being. Our doctors look at it all the time. And this collection of information is collecting in our city sewers, an infrastructure that's owned and managed and maintained by cities and municipalities. So we have all this data that's just flowing beneath our feet in cities on our health, and we're not looking at it. And that's because it's not very straightforward. You need a lot of different disciplines, a lot of different industries working together to make sense of this data. We need urban planners working together with engineers, wastewater infrastructure and public works departments. We need chemists, biologists. We need scientists in the lab working with public health departments and epidemiologists together with data scientists and elected officials to actually implement uh, policy based on the data that we see. And so this is why my co-founder and I founded Biobot Analytics. We are the first company in the world that is commercializing data from sewage. My co-founder and I met at MIT, where we did the foundational research behind our work. It was a collaboration between the Sensible City Lab and the Ulm Lab. We heard uh, a presentation by the Sensible City Lab director just before lunch, Professor Carlo Ratti. I was a student in his lab where I was researching the future of cities. And my co-founder was a PhD student in computational biology, where she really laid the scientific foundation behind, uh, under which our technology is built on. So now I'm very quickly going to walk through a little bit how this works, how our technology works. So we start by mapping the wastewater network in a city. This here is a map of Cambridge, Massachusetts, where we've overlaid the wastewater network on top of census data, so demographic information. And so we know that if we collect a sample from a given manhole, we know exactly what the upstream catchment is, what part of the city is flowing through that point. And then we can look at the demographic information associated with that area. Things such as median household income, uh, things such as median age, any sort of information that can help us design more effective public health policy or interventions. So we end up with a map that looks something like this. A city with smaller sub-catchments inside it, as well as a corresponding table that takes publicly available census data per each of our different locations. We then install our hardware units in these manholes. So this is a device that we design and manufacture uh, ourselves in-house. And it's just installed at the top of the manhole, and it hangs just a few feet above 
the, the sewer flow where tubes are pumping wastewater through a series of filters over seven days. These filters are removing the bacterial and the viral cells as well as capturing the chemistry. And then they are shipped back to our labs where we have a team of scientists that are looking at human viruses, human bacteria, and human chemicals in order to really paint this biochemical signature of these different communities. Now, given that we are a very young company, a very young startup, we had to pick one application to focus on. There are so many different things that we can learn from wastewater, but our bandwidth was limited. And so what did we choose to start with? Well, being that we are based in the United States, uh, we chose to tackle the biggest public health crisis in the US today, and that's the opioid epidemic. Today, opioid overdose is the leading cause of accidental death for Americans under the age of 50. It has surpassed car accidents as well as um, gun violence. Every single day in the US, there's over 130 individuals who are dying from a drug-related overdose. And this is the data that we're looking at, overdose deaths. This data is driving billions of dollars of government aid in the US every single year. And there's a few things that's wrong with this information. Well, first of all, this data is only collected when somebody dies, so it's very reactive. Second of all, this information is extremely delayed. It takes a very long time due to regulation and privacy um, in order to publish this information. So this plot was published by the New York Times based on a CDC report this summer in July of 2019 and it shows data to 2017 only. 2018 data is still provisional. Moreover, recent studies are showing that less than 1% of individuals who suffer from opioid use disorder are dying. So it doesn't matter how you slice or dice the data. We just don't have information on most of the people that can actually benefit from help and resources. So what's clear is that we're measuring the wrong thing. At BioBot, we are measuring right now these about 30 different drugs with our platform. So we are measuring illicit opioids such as heroin, fentanyl, deadly fentanyl analogs. We are measuring over half a dozen prescription opioids. We're also measuring treatment therapies like buprenorphine and methadone. So these are medications that you get prescribed by your doctor in order to help um, with opioid use disorder. We also measure Narcan, which is the overdose reversal drug, um, which reverses an overdose, and emerging trends, some other drugs that, that have been uh, suggested to us by public health departments. And so that map that I showed earlier ends up looking something like this. So you can see in the bar plots on the far right, we can see per neighborhood the different types of drugs that are more commonly used. Um, prescription opioids in yellow, fentanyl in blue, heroin in purple, and the treatment therapies in green. We can also then look per catchment area, and each one of these represent um, between five to 10,000 people, each catchment area what is the priority drug for that community? So as a public health agent, when you're going in and trying to engage the community uh, around this topic, what should you be talking about to really get through to people and make an impact? So last year, we worked with our first um, city, our first municipality uh, city partner, and they, managed to decrease overdoses by 40% last year in 2018. For the first time in half a decade, their no overdose numbers went down. And they credit this to being able to be, they credit this to having the right data and knowing exactly where to go and what to talk about. And I'm gonna show uh, some of the results that, that we found over our six month pilot with them, which we've now, uh, now we're ongoing, working with them on an ongoing basis. Um, but this information is from the six months that we worked with them last year. So this map here um, is an anonymized map of, of the town, of the city. And here we're looking at reported overdoses. So this is data that's given to us by the city. 
um, and it's reported overdoses in the year of 2018. And we created a heat map out of that information and overlaid it on top of the catchments that we were sampling in. And what you can see is that the overdose is really clustered in one part of the city, which is uh, fairly typical across most cities. Um, and so this was really the information that was guiding a lot of the work that the city was doing. The second map shows opioids as measured by our device across all of the parts of the city. And what you can see is that the maps don't really correlate. We see just the, more or less the same amount of consumption in the parts of the city where we had the highest levels of overdose, as well as areas where we didn't have any overdoses, but we still see a lot of consumption. With this information, the city really branched out their educational campaigns. They went into the parts of the city where, where they weren't actually talking about the opioid epidemic before, and actually had uh, created a series of um, educational seminars in the high schools, uh, in the schools there, and really reframed the conversation away from illicit drugs into prescription medication, which was really the priority in that area. And for the first time, they had community buy-in. So this data really helped them also reduce the stigma around drug use. This third map is showing the concentration of naloxone, which is that overdose reversal drug uh, that, that is uh, right now widely available in the US. And what we see is that naloxone, out of actually all the drugs we measured, correlates the most with the overdose map. Now this is good. What that means is that the city's distribution channels for Narcan, for naloxone, for the drug, are great. It's getting into the right hands and people are using it to save lives. However, we measured almost 30 times more doses of naloxone than the number of reported overdoses would have required in that same time frame. So what does that tell us? That tells us that for every overdose where 911 is being called and someone's reaching out for help, there's almost 30 more that are happening and are being rescued by bystanders, by friends and family members, and nobody is reaching out for help. So how are we supposed to get these resources into these communities if we actually don't know that the problem exists? So with this information, there's so many things the city can do. Number one, optimize their Narcan distribution. Number two, launch more targeted educational and prevention campaigns. Number three, we were also able to tell them that we barely saw any treatment in the city. So they've now engaged their healthcare providers to understand why methadone isn't being more widely prescribed. And finally, they're able to equip their emergency services, uh, ambulance, police, fire, with the knowledge, with real-time knowledge on what drugs are being used so they know how best to respond. Understanding the size of the population at risk for any illness helps public health departments allocate resources and appropriately plan and implement prevention, treatment, and recovery services. And this holds true beyond opioids into infectious disease, into any other public health crisis that we have going on in a given community. In 2018, when we started, uh, when we started the company, we were in one municipality. Today, we're deployed across eight, all in the US. Hopefully, we multiply by that same number next year um, as we grow, not only in North America, but abroad. But beyond opioids, and this is what I want to really underscore, we can detect thousands of biomarkers in wastewater. We can begin to look at influenza and infectious disease outbreaks. And much of the research work, actually, that we did at MIT focused really around the viruses and the bacteria. Imagine an early warning system for the next Zika outbreak or the next polio outbreak. We can begin to look at antibiotic resistance and understand antibiotic resistance and when it's emerging in a given community and give that feedback back to hospitals so that they know how the community is. We can look at asymptomatic diseases like hepatitis, uh, hepatitis C. 50% of people who have hepatitis C don't know they have it. And during this time, they're extremely contagious. So this can really help public health departments also understand the levels of asymptomatic diseases in a community. B 
beyond the biology, we can move into diet and nutrition. We can begin to understand what foods people are eating, begin to identify food deserts in a community, begin to understand how uh, fruits, vegetables are penetrating into, into a community versus other processed foods like salt and sugar. And then of course, pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals beyond opioids uh, as a proxy for other illnesses and nicotine and alcohol consumption. How does this information help us uh, put out policies to try and curb some of these behaviors and then really monitor the impact of those policies over time? Beyond government, we see this data being useful to the private sector as well. We imagine being able to develop partnerships with pharmaceutical companies as well as hospitals so that they can understand what the priorities are in their community or they can understand what priority drugs should be in, in their R&D pipeline. And so with that, I'm gonna end with, you know, can you imagine now a world in which these headlines don't exist because we're really getting to the root of the problem before it becomes a problem? Thank you.